Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Barbara Malkus, board president of the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. And I am very pleased to welcome all of you to the first annual Margot Simon Golden Memorial Webinar, advocating for health toward a cancer-free future. Before we begin today's program, I would like to share MBCC's mission statement. Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition is dedicated to preventing the environmental causes of breast cancer through community education, research advocacy, and changes to public policy. I would also like to take a moment to tell you about the person for whom this new annual event has been named, Margot Simon Golden. Many in our audience are likely already familiar with Margot, who sadly passed away a year ago. Margot served in my role as board president for over a decade. She was a tireless advocate for and believer in the mission statement I just shared with you. Moreover, she was a compassionate ally and friend to so many in the MBCC community. And she is missed by all who knew her personally and professionally. We are honored to have Margot's family with us today as we honor her legacy with a lively discussion on the topics that were so important to her, followed by the presentation of an award in, in her name. Before we begin, I would like to ask you to join me in a moment of silence to honor and remember Margot. Thank you. I am very proud to introduce our distinguished panel for today's webinar. Dr. Arlene Bloom, PhD, is the Executive Director of the Green Science Policy Institute and a Research Associate in Chemistry at UC Berkeley. The Institute's scientific research and policy work with both government and business has reduced the use of classes of harmful chemicals, including flame retardants and fluorinated chemicals in consumer products worldwide. Welcome, Dr. Bloom. Thank you. I'm very honored to join you for this wonderful event. And I'm gonna start by introducing uh, PFAS in food packaging, what you should know and what you can do. Thank you so much. Dr. Laurel Shader is a senior scientist at Silent Spring Institute, where she leads the Institute's water quality research on PFAS and other contaminants of emerging concern. She studies PFAS chemicals in drinking water, consumer products, food and drinking water contamination from septic systems, and environmental justice disparities in drinking water quality. She is the lead investigator of PFAS REACH, a study evaluating PFAS immunotoxicity in children and addressing the needs of communities affected by PFAS water contamination. She is part of the University of Rhode Island Steep Super Excuse me, Super Fund Research Program, and she is the lead investigator of a study funded by the CDC ATSDR on PFAS health effects in two communities in Eastern Massachusetts. Welcome, Dr. Shader. Nice to be here, thank you. Dr. Maricel Maffini is an environmental health scientist and independent consultant. She has more than 25 years of research experience in the fields of carcinogenesis and breast cancer in particular, as well as reproductive biology and endocrine disruption. For the past 10 years, her work has focused on the safety and regulation of chemicals in food and the decision-making process behind them. Welcome, Dr. Maffini. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And I am also pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Jill S. Oxley, MD, FACS, who is a breast cancer surgeon at the Cape Cod Hospital and the director of the hospital's breast health program. Dr. Oxley is a member of MBCC's board of directors. Welcome, my friend, Dr. Oxley. Thank you, Dr. Malkus. I'm happy to be here. Um, we'll have each panelist give their presentation and then we'll hold the Q&A session. But please feel free to submit your questions in the chat panel. Let's begin with Dr. Bloom. Okay. 
try sharing my screen. Um, okay, as I said, I'm going to speak about PFAS in food packaging, um, what you should know and what you can do. Okay, let's click, maybe it will advance. All right, so um, our institute are scientists. Uh, we do research, um, we bring decision makers together, and then we communicate uh, to affect change, both in government policy and also in purchasing. Um, we deal with the problem that there are tens of thousands of chemicals out there in everyday products. Uh, it can take many years of scientific research and advocacy to change even one of these chemicals to phase it out. And often when it is phased out or banned, the replacement is a very similar chemical, a regrettable substitute. Uh, at the same time, we know that so many of these chemicals are problematic. Uh, so at a retreat, we came up with one idea for thinking about these chemicals, which is sorting them into families or classes that have similar function structure and um, toxicity. And the six classes we came up with are PFAS, antimicrobials, flame retardants, bisphenols and phthalates, some solvents and certain metals. And I encourage people to take a few minutes and go to sixclasses.org and they can watch a, a four minute video about each of these classes. And when a chemical is in these classes, uh, we want to ask, do you really need this chemical? Is it worth it? Um, if you say to a mom, you can have a very fine white stain repellent carpet, but the PFAS to do that um, will end up in your children causing health harm and on the planet forever, she might say it's not necessary or worth it. Um, but if she really wants that stain repellency, then let's look for a safer alternative using green chemistry. So today we are speaking about the classic PFAS, and I like to say they're my favorite class because they're so bad. Um, and that's because of the very strong bond between carbon and fluorine. It's the strongest bond in the periodic table. And that gives uh, PFAS their useful properties of oil and water repellency. But the bond is so strong that they never break down in the environment. So the PFAS that are on our carpets or our food packaging last forever. They, they don't break down. Um, you can, a good place to learn a little about PFAS is the film Dark Waters. If you haven't seen it, um, it's recommended. Um, and it tells the story of uh, West Virginia, Ohio communities with high levels. And um, there was a, a settlement, the money was used to study, um, inhabitants of those communities and uh, it was found that all of them and indeed just about all of us have PFAS in our bodies and a group of health effects were found in these original studies. Uh, since then it's been found that PFAS are indeed multi-system toxicants. Uh, they adversely impact so many of our organs, our immune systems, neurodevelopment, um, so they're, they're very generally problematic all over our bodies. Um, another problem is that special one with PFAS, that regrettable substitute problem. Um, the old PFAS that were commonly used were called C8s because they were eight carbons surrounded by fluorine. And um, after they were first found to be problematic in the 60s. Uh, 50 years wow. later, they were phased out due to their extreme persistence, bioaccumulation, and toxicity. Uh, but the most common substitutes were the C6. Uh, and they are similar in structure, function, equally persistent, perhaps less bioaccumulative in people, but they build up in plants. Um, and increasingly, they're being found to be equally toxic to the C8s. They actually move faster because they're shorter, uh, they're harder to filter out of water because filters that take out the bigger C8, the C6s can go through uh, in food packaging. Indeed, uh, like other products, the manufacturers went from C8 to C6 being reassured that, that C6 was, was just fine. 
um, we wrote a paper uh, along with some of the people on this panel and, and a total of 16 scientists on the scientific basis for managing uh, all of PFAS as one chemical class uh, because they're all persistent, potentially toxic, and there just is not enough time to study them all. Um, on our PFAS Central website, uh, there's a banner at the top. You can watch a short video about this um, paper. And indeed, it was on last week tonight with Donna Oliver uh, mentioned the class concept on PFAS when he, he did a, pro a recommended humorous program on PFAS. Um, so PFAS is very much in the news. We have a website called PFAS Central where every week we um, curate the best news articles on PFAS, uh, the best scientific papers with a short explanation of what they're about. We include policy, events, jobs, um, everything PFAS. So if those of you come to be as interested in PFAS as the people on this panel, check out PFAS Central. And our most popular page is um, the PFAS free page, which uh, lists a lot of products that don't contain PFAS, including kinds of nonstick cookware and disposable foodware, uh, the subject today. So PFAS are problematic and difficult to clean up. Prevention is preferable. That's what we're going to be talking about today with regard to food packaging. Uh, a lot has happened. Um, in 2018, Washington State banned uh, food packaging containing PFAS, followed by Maine and the country of Denmark uh, in 2019, the city of San Francisco, New York. It's been listed in California as a priority product for regulation, and uh, no PFAS is allowed in um, packaging for meals ready to eat for the military. Um, so, so people recognize the problem and are taking action. Uh, in fact, phase out of PFAS worldwide is getting traction. There have been proposals from the Nordic countries, Netherlands, and Germany to phase out all PFAS and products in Europe by 2025. Canada is working to address uh, uh, most PFAS. Um, just recently, our government um, committed to stop purchasing certain products containing any PFAS, and Maine is a state that's taken the lead in requiring, I believe, next year, uh, information on all products containing PFAS and their ban uh, by 2030, unless they're currently avoidable. So I think this is all optimistic news. Um, a lot of products are moving away from PFAS. Carpet industry has mostly stopped using it. We hope that meetings like this will help move it out of uh, food packaging. It is moving out of furniture, outdoor gear and clothing, and very importantly, firefighting foam. So I will just end by saying the reduced use of PFAS, um, we can have a healthier world. And uh, thank you. And I'd like to pass this now on to Laurel Shader from Silent Spring Institute. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Uh, we'll now turn it over to Dr. Shader. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, just one second here while I get the prompt to share my screen. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk about PFAS and food packaging and also to be a part of the first Margot Simon Golden Memorial webinar. So I'm going to build on um, Arlene's presentation and talk about what we know about food packaging as a source of PFAS exposure. Okay, so um, Silent Spring Institute, um, many of you may know, is an independent nonprofit research organization. We were actually founded in 1994 by activists at Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition um, to be a mission-driven scientific organization to understand links between everyday chemical exposures and health with a focus on women's health and breast cancer prevention. PFAS have been on our radar screen for a long time, starting with our earliest work discovering PFAS in um, drinking water on Cape Cod in 2010. Our work has also focused on exposures from food and food packaging. I'll tell you a little bit more about a study that we published in 2017 on PFAS in fast food packaging. And our other work has also evaluated how people's diet can affect their PFAS exposure 
and other sources of exposure, such as um, consumer products. So how do we know that PFAS are in food packaging? Um, well, we know that certain PFAS are approved by the US FDA to be added to food packaging. Uh, the earliest approval came in the 1960s. And I know Maricel will talk more about that process. PFAS chemicals can confer grease, oil, and water resistance to food packaging items. So they keep our hands from getting greasy um, when they're added to certain types of food packaging. Um, another property of PFAS is that they are extremely stable, even at high temperatures. Their carbon fluorine bonds are very strong, and so they, um, they are very resistant to being uh, broken down. Um, unfortunately, you, you can't really know whether there's PFAS in your food packaging just by looking at it. Um, there's no, there are no labels, and you can't, you can't tell by any of the, the properties of the packaging whether it is PFAS. But scientists can test uh, paper packaging for the presence of PFAS. Um, some of these types of tests look for the presence of fluorine. So PFAS, by their chemical structures, have many fluorine atoms. And so where we see elevated levels of fluorine in um, packaging, um, that's an indication of the presence of PFAS, because paper by itself doesn't have that much fluorine. Um, there are also ways to test for individual specific PFAS chemicals that might migrate out of the packaging and potentially um, end up in food that we consume. Um, Arlene already has touched on um, the wide range of harmful health effects that have been linked to PFAS exposures. Um, I wanted to highlight a few in particular. Um, some of what we know about PFAS toxicity comes from studies in uh, populations of people who've been exposed. So these are epidemiological studies. Um, and other evidence uh, comes from toxicological studies, so studies in laboratory animals. And there's an increasing body of evidence as well from what we call in vitro laboratory tests, for, in for instance, studies that are based in, in cells or look at certain biological receptors and how they um, can be affected by PFAS. Um, so, other health, so some of the health effects that have been associated with PFAS exposure include elevated cholesterol, thyroid disease, certain types of cancer, decreases in birth weight, ulcerative colitis, um, preeclampsia, or high blood pressure during pregnancy. Um, one health effect that's been getting a lot of concern lately, especially with the COVID pandemic, um, is immune system toxicity, including decreased vaccine response. So there are concerns among exposed communities and among scientists that people who've had high PFAS exposures may be more susceptible to COVID-19 um, and concerns that um, the vaccine may be somewhat less effective. Um, and that's an active area of research right now. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, there are studies that have found that PFAS can alter mammary gland development in laboratory animals, and this raises a red flag for us because we think that's a, a hallmark of chemicals that can increase breast cancer risk. So what types of food packaging are most likely to contain PFAS? Um, I, I would, at the top of my list are microwave popcorn bags. Um, these pretty consistently have been found to contain PFAS. Um, there was a study in 2017 from the Center for Environmental Health that found uh, that 100% of the microwave popcorn bags they tested uh, were PFAS treated. I wanted to mention the results from a 2017 study led by Silent Spring Institute on PFAS in fast food packaging. For this study, we collaborated with Arlene and the Green Science Policy Institute, Environmental Working Group, as well as um, scientists from Notre Dame, uh, Graham Peasley and Mark Streiner from EPA. Um, the results of this study indicated that nearly half of the paper wrappers that we tested from 2014 and 2015 uh, were likely to contain PFAS, as did about one in five of the paper boards, so kind of the thicker um, box uh, paper that we tested um, contained PFAS. Um, so that was, that was certainly concerning to see, but on the flip side, it also showed that um, many of the samples that we tested did not contain uh, PFAS, and so that showed that there are alternatives already available on the market. Um, it's been, uh, it was really great to see that the results of this work received a lot of um, attention, and um, some of it was humorous, but on a more serious note, it's also informed policy, which has been really gratifying to see that a number of states have um, used results from our study um, and other evidence in their efforts to restrict PFAS in food packaging. Another type of uh, 
packaging where PFAS have been found is what's called molded fiber packaging. You might not be familiar with that specific name, but if you've gotten, say, uh, food from a hot food bar or a salad bar, you might see these um, brown, they look pretty eco-friendly kinds of containers or bowls. Um, testing from an a online news uh, outlet, The Counter, found that 100% of the compostable bowls that they tested uh, contained PFAS back in 2019. A study from Toxic Free Future and Safer Chemicals, Healthy Families in 2019, um, found that some of the samples they tested at grocery stores also contained PFAS, um, and a number of these were molded fiber um, packaging. So the presence of PFAS in food packaging is of concern for environmental contamination reasons. We know that communities around manufacturing plants where PFAS are produced can be exposed to elevated levels of PFAS from environmental discharges. There are also growing concerns about what happens at the end of the life cycle of food packaging. Where do those, what happens to those PFAS when, um, when that food packaging gets disposed of? But it's also of concern because PFAS can migrate out of food packaging and into the food that we're eating. The extent of that migration depends on a number of factors. So it depends on the temperature of the food, um, so higher temper at higher temperatures, we tend to see more migration. The longer amount of time that food is in contact with the packaging provides more opportunities for migration. And also foods with emulsifiers. So these are additives that prevent oil and water from separating. There's also evidence that PFAS can uh, migrate into popcorn um, from microwave popcorn bags. And certain PFAS are what we call volatile. So that means that they can end up in the air that we breathe. Arlene talked a little bit about the shift that's happened over time away from the long chain or legacy PFAS chemicals um, to newer alternative PFAS. Some of these are called short chain based on their shorter chemical structure. Um, and just as these short chain PFAS are more mobile in the environment and more likely to pass through water filters, they're also more likely to migrate out of food packaging. This was uh, data from a 2016 study comparing the percent of PFAS that leached out of paper bowls. And you can see as we're moving from longer chain to shorter chain PFAS, we see a higher percentage of those PFAS that are able to be leached out of the bowls. So that indicates that there may be higher levels of exposure to these short chain PFAS that are more likely to be used now. Some of our research has also looked for associations between what uh, between people's PFAS exposure and uh, dietary patterns. So this was a, from a study that we published in 2019 where we analyzed data compiled by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on a representative sampling of Americans. The study included measurements of PFAS levels in blood, which is a marker of the extent of exposure, and information about dietary patterns. And from the study, we found that people who ate more microwave popcorn tended to have higher levels of PFAS in their blood. We also found that people who ate more meals at home tended to have lower levels of PFAS in their blood. And this could have to do with um, more packaging and more contact between food and food packaging um, for food that's consumed from restaurants. It could also have to do with different types of foods that people eat when they're out at a restaurant versus at their home. This is consistent with several other published studies as well, as well that have found links between um, dietary patterns and particularly consumption of snacks like popcorn and higher levels of PFAS in blood. So I appreciated what Arlene said about treating PFAS as a class. And I think it's really important when we're talking about the thousands of different PFAS that fall under this broad term called PFAS that we address these as a class because they all share certain shared properties of having many carbon fluorine bonds that make them extremely persistent in the environment. And we can't tackle this problem by just addressing one or a handful of PFAS at a time. Um, and there have been some important shifts in recent years um, that have adopted this class-based idea um, and movement away from PFAS in food packaging. Um, there's been a lot of action at the state level in terms of bans on PFAS and food packaging, and there are six states currently that have enacted bans. Here in Massachusetts, there are a pair of bills in the Massachusetts House and Senate on PFAS um, in food packaging that are currently being considered. We'll hear more about those later. 
Um, another area where there's been a lot of action has actually come from retailers and from restaurant chains making commitments to eliminate PFAS. So I've listed here a number of brands that have made a commitment to eliminate PFAS from their food packaging. And it's been really, um, to me, really reassuring that brands like Chipotle and Sweetgreen, when um, information about PFAS in their products become available, that they've um, taken action and made a commitment to um, switch to other types of packaging. And the third trend that I wanted to mention is an increased desire for compostability. There's more movement to reclaiming food waste and composting uh, when possible. Um, and the presence of PFAS in food packaging that's labeled compostable really poses a, a challenge because these are chemicals that really don't break down over time. So for instance, the Biodegradable Products Institute in 2020 adopted a new standard for compostability which require that PFAS not be added to packaging. Um, I mentioned earlier our study on PFAS in food packaging. This was um, if, uh, the wording of the legislation in New York State um, that when it adopted its ban on PFAS in food packaging. Um, and as a researcher, it can be really a slow process to see the impact of the work that we do. And it was really gratifying to see that the wording of this legislation actually specifically cited our 2017 study. So I try to end my presentations with some tips for things that, um, that you can do. Um, there are some things as individuals, um, that, some steps that we can take to um, try to avoid PFAS in our everyday lives. So for instance, I'd say avoiding microwave popcorn is kind of an easy one. Um, and when possible, eating more fresh foods. Um, we're talking today mostly about food packaging, but PFAS or in many different types of consumer products. So there are some steps that we can take, such as um, avoiding stain resistant coatings on furnishings. Um, but really it shouldn't be up to us as individuals to have to have chemicals on our mind when we go shopping. Um, and in many communities um, that are food deserts, there's not as many options for um, more fresh foods. Um, so at a more systemic level, I think it's important as individuals um, that we take steps to um, let retailers know um, that it's important to you to have um, products and food packaging that doesn't contain PFAS. Um, the reason why we have PFAS so broadly in our everyday environment, um, even though they are linked with so many health effects, um, is that we don't really have a system where chemicals are adequately tested for safety before they go into widespread use. Um, as individuals, we can learn and share information about ways to avoid toxic chemicals. I would recommend our Silent Spring Institute Detox Me smartphone app um, for tips on avoiding PFAS and other everyday chemicals of concern. Um, and it's incumbent on all of us to stay up to date about state and local legislation. Um, for those of you in Massachusetts, the uh, MBCC website has information about the um, bills that are currently being considered in Massachusetts related to PFAS in food packaging as well as another pair of bills related to um, toxic-free children's products. So with that, I wanted to wrap up here. Uh, thank, again, MBCC for organizing this webinar today. Um, I wanted to share some uh, website information for Silent Spring Institute, um, for the PFAS exchange and the um, URI SEEP. Sorry, let me go back here. Um, Uh, the Silent Spring Institute website, the PFAS Exchange, which is a product of our PFAS REACH study, um, and the URI SEEP Superfund Research Program. And I just wanted to end here um, with acknowledging and honoring the memory of Margot Simon Golden. I had the privilege of meeting with her on multiple occasions, navigating the hallways of the Massachusetts State House, and meeting with legislators to talk about our work. I was always really inspired by her quiet determination and grateful for all of her tireless efforts to support Silent Spring Institute and to protect public health. So with that, I will hand this back over to Dr. Oxley. Thank you very much, Dr. Shader. Um, we'll turn the presentation now over to Dr. Marisol Maffini. Okay, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? 
Yes, we can. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in the, this very special webinar. Um, my name is Marisol Maffini. I'm an independent consultant. And as such, I want to uh, disclose that I work with uh, different NGOs and also with uh, companies uh, that they are trying to do better when it comes to um, chemicals used in food packaging, specifically in PFAS. And uh, I also co-author petitions to requesting FDA to remove approvals of chemicals that don't, shouldn't be in, in packaging. And although I do work with different organizations, these are my, my own opinions. So um, I want to briefly mention what FDA's role is in this um, particular issue. The um, FDA is the Food and Drug Administration, and they are in charge of regulating chemicals that are used in directly in food or in contact with food. And it is uh, the FDA administered a, a law that was passed in 1958 and uh, that is called Food Additives Amendment. That law contains all, all the uh, framework for regulation of chemicals that are in food. So what is important here to understand is that unlike other laws that deal with uh, toxic chemicals, for uh, a chemical to be used in food first needs to be shown that it's safe before it is added to food. And that is quite important. So it's basically what I like to Call is a chemical is unsafe until it's shown to be safe. And safe means that there is a reasonable certainty that the use of the particular chemical will not cause harm. And there is an important clause in the law that it is um, unfortunately hasn't been um, fully implemented. That is that uh, the company or, or, or the agency, FDA in this case, that makes the safety the decision needs to take into consideration the cumulative effects of similar chemicals in the diet. And also it's important that um, regardless of how much or how little um, the exposure would be, a chemical that is known to cause cancer in animal or man, a carcinogen, is prohibited to be used in food. So very briefly here again uh, to show uh, some of the uses of PFAS in contact with food. And as it was said already, it's a very handy chemistry because it resists high temperature, repels water and oil, and uh, it doesn't um, get our food all stuck in our uh, food uh, cookware. So these are some of the authorized uses of PFAS. As Lauren mentioned, um, microwave popcorn uh, is very common, but all kinds of uh, paper, fiber-based materials, and also plastics. And that this can be also for single use materials like your salad, a bowl, some containers, takeout containers, or for multiple uses, repeat uses components of machines that are used in food processing equipment. So this is just a reminder, we'll be talking about PFAS, but I want to uh, tell everybody that is a very long name. That's why we use acronyms. But PFAS mean per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Basically here, I'm showing you where you see the red arrows here. Per means that every single carbon in this molecule is uh, completely fluorinated. There are no other atoms. Um, and that is uh, a per means fully. And then the polyfluorinated is the one underneath uh, where you see where the green arrow is, that carbon molecule has not been fluorinated. So not all the carbons in the molecule are fully fluorinated. Some are uh, retaining the hydrogen bonds here. And again, short and long chains. And uh, Arlene did a very nice job and, and Lauren, uh, repeated that of the importance of these two terms, what is short and what is long. And for many decades, we have, uh, we have been led to believe that the short chain PFAS were better. Um, they were better and safer. They didn't accumulate in the body. That is basically the main characteristic of the long chain PFAS. 
So probably some of you may have heard the name PFOA or PFOA is usually a very common name to um, associate it with the long chain PFAS. And the main issue is that once these chemicals enter the body, the body, they stay there for years and years and years. So that bioaccumulation in the body means that it's very hard to predict how toxic it could be because the, the chemicals will continue to uh, leave those pockets where it, it is uh, accumulated in the body and continue to cause um, toxicity. So for a long time, now we know that the long chain PFAS are unsafe. But as I said, both companies and FDA had draw this very strong red line uh, with very little evidence that the short chains were better than the long chains. And that red line started to crumble uh, with more evidence that came out from 2015 uh, forward. Um, FDA scientists um, started to dig deeper into this are the short chain PFAS really better? Well, they, the first hint was um, published by the FDA scientists in 2018, where they actually concluded that a type of short chain PFAS um, is actually likely to accumulate in the body, just as the long chain PFAS. They saw in, in data that they collected and they have to request from some of the manufacturers of these chemicals that uh, the animals were not eliminating this chemical as fast as they thought. And they also saw that, that some humans, some uh, workers in ski resorts also had a very hard time really uh, uh, eliminating uh, this short chain PFAS from the bodies because it was present in ski walks. So that was the first time they realized that there may be a problem and that red line is just basically dis disappearing now. Two years later in 2020, the same group of investigators from FDA confirmed that this short term uh, short chain PFAS actually by accumulating the body when it enters the body the, the body tries to break it down and some of those breakdown products actually uh, accumulate and not only that they also confirm through a very thorough analysis that these short chain PFAS are of uh, a high risk uh, to human health uh, because in addition to the bioaccumulation they also have uh, toxicities that were not known before. So as a result of that, FDA went to the companies that have requested the authorization of the use of these chemicals in contact with food and um, basically sent them a letter and the companies agreed to phase out these products based um, on the health concerns that FDA um, demonstrated with their, their studies and also data from some of the companies that had not been submitted to the agency when they were supposed to. FDA actually had to ask for more information and when they started digging in that information that was not given to them at the time they were supposed to be reviewing the safety of these chemicals um, they they found all the information they needed and confirmed that this is this uses were not safe. So in 2018, in 2019, actually FDA sent letters to three companies, Daikin, um, Asahi, and Arcroma, telling them about their concerns, in, which included not only the bioaccumulation in the body, but also liver cancer toxicity to the immune system, as, as Lauren mentioned, uh, reproductive and neurological problems, and also developmental toxicity in animals. So um, I, just one more thing I want to mention here, that um, the letter um, that we obtained through a Freedom of Information Act that was sent to the companies really show some sense of urgency 
for the companies to stop using and stop selling these products. However, uh, FDA ended up giving the companies until 2024 to stop selling their products. So that is quite disappointing because, um, again, these products are, are in use and uh, they accumulate in our bodies. So another step that FDA took uh, to figure out how much we're exposed to this in the diet was to start testing um, foods. Up until 2019, they were only were, were had tested a few things. One were actually cranberries from Massachusetts that um, one of the companies that has cranberry box uh, had asked the agency to test uh, for PFAS uh, um, because they had had a contamination from uh, their water was contaminated. Um, but uh, up until 2019, it was not system systematically done and that has changed. Um, FDA has developed methods. They can test for 16 PFAS in various food types at a very low level. However, they are testing for PFAS that come from environmental contaminations. They are not testing the PFAS that the agency has authorized for use in contact with food. Um, they also have tested food from areas that are known to be contaminated, like in North Carolina around the, uh, the Keymore's plant. They have um, Keymore's with the spin-off company from DuPont. Um, that is a, a historical manufacturer of, of PFAS. Um, they have found PFAS in um, vegetables, free uh, in, in le lettuce and, and other leafy vegetables um, that were sold like five miles um, away from the Keymore's plant. Um, also, New Mexico, a dairy farm that they had groundwater contaminated with uh, PFAS from a military facility close by. And now they have expanded this to all uh, general food um, products um, that they are collected uh, throughout the year in different areas of the country. So they are trying to implement a more systematic um, testing of food. And they, uh, FDA then try to identify uh, if there are uh, some problems uh, when it comes to the safety of, of the um, the products that they tested uh, based on the amount that they can detect. Um, now, this is also new. This has been an unexpected uh, source of PFAS and it was um, prompted by uh, a study coming from Massachusetts actually. In, in late November, 2020, uh, the public employees for environmental responsibility group alerted the Environmental Protection Agency of PFAS contaminating pesticides. So they have measured, um, tested pesticide, I forgot the name of the pesticide, uh, but um, they have found levels of PFAS. So they alerted EPA immediately. And what EPA investigated um, resulted in a very interesting um, finding. That is that it was the plastic container the one that was leaching PFAS into the pesticide. So this plastic container is a high density polyethylene. Um, some of you may have seen this, this acronym HDPE in some of your detergent bottles or plastic bottles um, like laundry detergent or, or, or um, uh, shampoo, or even in some cases, some of the um, uh, milk uh, plastic containers are uh, made of uh, HDPE because the very good plastic is the most of the one of the most um, uh, recyclable plastics in in the supply chain. So they announced that the the PFAS were coming from the plastic, and then they released the results and they tested different type of containers from the small uh, two and a half gallon drums all the way to 55 gallon drums. And this is just briefly to, to show you that when they measured um, the PFAS, they measure many of them, um, they found all different sizes and lengths of PFAS. For instance, the first thing is that 
they had containers that were not fluorinated. And they, as you can see here on the top, the amounts of PFAS they found was very, very, very small compared to all the fluorinated um, containers. And if you can see the, the last one, the 55 gallon drum, uh, you have of PFAS, the blue one is a PFAS that only have four carbons. Um, the next one has five carbons, but all of them had the, the most famous PFAS that is before us. So basically blasting fluorine gas into a plastic makes a barrier and that barrier is basically forming PFAS right there at the moment of the of the gas uh, blasting into the plastic. And what is the FDA connection here? Well, FDA in 1983 authorized the use of fluorine gas to actually fluorinate polyethylene plastics. So this has been in the regulations since 1983. And FDA authorized this, the use of fluorine gas to treat uh, polyethylene um, in amounts that produce up to 5,000 parts per billion of total fluorine in the food in the container, which is uh, incredible, incredibly high. Um, also important to note, based on marketing, that we have identified that the fluorination is not just for using polyethylene plastics is used for many other different types of plastics. So FDA has been working with EPA and what they have done so far was to make a public um, um, warning to companies. They published this letter in, in the summer of 2021 say that if they don't follow the fluorination process and limits that are in the regulations, any alternative process for fluorination of polyethylene are not in compliance and are basically unlawful. So I haven't been able to find any public uh, information about responses from companies or who, which specific companies FDA has reached out to and are working on this, but this is basically still an, is ongoing. So I want to uh, present here a little bit of, a, of an optimistic uh, view of the issues on PFAS in food. Um, and as you can see here on the top left corner, everything started in 2008 when FDA sent the first batch of letters to companies um, about their, their concerns on the, in the use of uh, long chain PFAS in contact with food. And this included um, some of the biggest manufacturers of PFAS. So three years later, the manufacturers inform FDA that they, are, they were going to seize the interstate commerce of seven of these long chain PFAS. However, many others remain in use. So in 2014, I was involved in writing this petition. Nine public interest organizations, we actually petitioned FDA to ban the long chain PFAS because they were unsafe. And that petition was granted in 2016, as you can see here in the green um, box. And actually, FDA made the declaration that the uses were unsafe for human consumption. Um, in 2018, again, the scientists, the good scientists at FDA, had um, continued to produce more evidence. Now, in this case, the short chain PFAS that bioaccumulate, that resulted in um, two things. Uh, one is that FDA sent letters to these companies the producers of the short chains, and for the first time uh, talks about the short chain class of PFAS. FDA so far has only de uh, dealt with PFAS one chemical at a time. And this one, this is the first time that they talk about the, the class of short chain PFAS, what I think is, is important for all the reasons that Arlene uh, gave us. And also in 2019, recognizing that this is this is ongoing, FDA started to test foods. 
Um, again, in 2020, more good news in, in a way. Uh, their their um, confirmation of bioaccumulation of short chain PFAS and the companies agreeing to phase out because there are still PFAS in the regulations and other authorized uses. Uh, in 2021, again, I was involved in writing this petition. We submitted um, 11 public interest organizations, submitted another petition to FDA to basically ban all forms of PFAS that bioaccumulate. And we have the letter from FDA about the, the plastic fluorination compliance. And um, I am hoping to continue this uh, good uh, streak of luck in a way uh, in, in 2021 that has just begun. And the, uh, very briefly mentioning here all the great work that is done in different states. Um, a year, a little bit over a year ago when we have a, a webinar on this issue, I showed the map on the left uh, where there were 142 current policies on 28 states and 38 policies in 15 states. This is overall PFAS efforts. A year later, there were already 72 adopted policies in 21 states, and there are 102 um, uh, current policies already. So this is fantastic job that uh, our colleagues in the different states are doing, and, and thank you, the people from Massachusetts as well for, for doing so. And just briefly here, uh, again, uh, things started in 2018 with Washington State banning the use of PFAS in, 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 in paper-based uh, food packaging, followed by Maine and New York. In 2021, we, uh, we have Vermont, Maine, as Arlene mentioned, ban it in all products. California, Connecticut, Minnesota, Michigan. Michigan is the first state using procurement as a tool to um, stop um, the uses of PFAS. Um, and these are the bills um, in Massachusetts. I was asked to, to write a, a letter of support for this bill, and I was happy to do so because it's a very important issue. And now this is my last slide. Um, I, I think we have to start um, seriously thinking about turning off the tap on PFAS. And the two main um, agencies that regulate the commerce of chemicals at large scales are the Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration. So with my colleague, Lauren Ellis, we wrote an, an op-ed at the end of 2021, um, where we are proposing seven ways that the um, White House could uh, use to turn off the tap on PFAS. Um, and this is this is a, the list, I leave it here for you. But I want to mention one specific issue where I think as a society we need to start uh, thinking about, and that is the concept of essential uses. Uh, Arlene gave an example uh, in her talk about the, the beautiful red, uh, black, white, uh, pristine rug uh, that will stay like that. Uh, but to have it, you need to have PFAS that will come out and contaminate your pets, your family, um, and it could cause problems. So I think there is something that as a society, we need to figure out if we want this type of products in um, for uses that are not necessarily essential, like having an year round, very white, bright carpet. Um, uh, and what is the risk we want to take? So um, thank you. And I, I pass it on to um, Dr. Oxley. Thank you, Dr. Mafini. Uh, now we have time to take some questions. And again, I encourage our audience to submit questions via the chat function. Uh, so Dr. Bloom, if you're on, I'll start with you. Uh, are fluoropolymers in food packaging an exposure concern? Uh, Dr. Bloom, we can't hear you.
Oh, great. Okay, sorry. Um, fluoropolymers are big molecules of monomeric. Mono means one, poly means many. And um, a lot of the usage is fluoropolymers. Um, so something that's a polymer is very big and unlikely to end up in our bodies. Um, however, the manufacture of fluoropolymers is a big problem. The workers are exposed. Uh, the end of life disposal is a problem. And often fluoropolymers are contaminated with smaller monomers and oligomers. Mm -hmm. So I would say, um, I, I agree with what Marcel said, that we, we, we don't really want fluorinated uh, molecules in our products, in, particularly in our food packaging. But in all fairness, um, a, a big polymeric molecule has less immediate health harm potential than a smaller molecule. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bloom. Yeah. Um, Dr. Shader, what suggestions do you have for people who order takeout from restaurants? Are there any steps that can be taken to reduce that risk? Sure. Well, that's that's a great question, and you know, I as someone who um, you know enjoys having takeout, and I think during the pandemic, it's been really important to support local restaurants, and people have been eating in restaurants less, and so relying on takeout more. Um, you know, I think it's there are some things we can do, but it really is is more of a broader systemic change that needs to happen. Um, I think something like microwave popcorn, I guess that's not strictly takeout, but that's an example of something where it's pretty easy to substitute that by making popcorn a different way. Um, again, as a consumer, it's difficult to tell by looking at packaging whether or not it contains PFAS, um, the kind of papery, wax paper kind of packaging is the, the type that's most likely to, so things that come wrapped in aluminum foil, you know, that wouldn't contain PFAS. Um, and there are probably some small things you can do that might make a, a little difference, like taking the food out of the packaging right away rather than letting it sit in the packaging for more extended amounts of time. So those are some some small things, I guess, that, that we can do. Um, but again, it really shouldn't be on us to be worrying about that when we're eating <laughs> dinner or lunch from a, a restaurant. And, it, you know, I think the broader systemic changes that need to happen to um, identify PFAS and food packaging as a non-essential use and just work towards um, getting out, them out of packaging in the first place is really the longer term solution. Um, and getting back to the question you asked um, Arlene as well, I, I totally agree with what you said about fluoropolymers and um, you know, in our study of fast food packaging, there were um, many samples where we found quite high levels of fluorine in in the packaging and most of that didn't come out. Most of it was not in a molecule that we could identify when we um, you know, put it in solvent and saw what came out. But it is those smaller compounds, the one that we have the most information about their toxicity, the ones that show up in water. It might not be the, the most abundant and they're not the, the large polymers, but those definitely raise the most concern. And, and polymers don't just come together on their own. There's There are those smaller mm -hmm. compounds that are used as building blocks or used as processing aids. Thank you, Dr. Shader. Uh, Dr. Maffini, question, what can citizens do to avoid these chemicals that seem to be in so many products? Yes, I think I have to uh, follow what, uh, or repeat a little bit of what uh, Laurel said. Um, but it, we, we don't really know. Um, however, I think I think we can do better as, as, as consumers by contacting the companies. Don't be shy to call a number or send an email. Use social media. Companies are very sensitive to what consumers are saying in social media. So ask them, does this plastic bottle has PFAS in it? Does the pizza box, the, the, the cardboard, the round cardboard where the pizza, the frozen pizza comes in, does that have PFAS in it? Um, so I think a little bit more of activism uh, and letting them know that it is we are not okay with some of those uses that we can do better. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Maffini. So another question: um, Are scientists finding health concerns from PFAS other than PFOA and PFOS? 
Yes. <laughs> the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, there are studies from the National Toxicology, no, um, the um, ATSDR, Lauren probably can spell out what it means, but it's part of the, CD, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. They showed um, one of them, PFBN, I think it is, um, that is a short chain PFAS, has uh, similar problems in animals at least than PFOA or PFOS. Uh, they may be eliminated a little faster from the body, but the toxicity is similar. Uh, and the same thing with the ones that I mentioned, um, this uh, 6-2-FTOH short chain chemicals, they do cause a lot of problems, including uh, cancer. Uh, and cancer that is not genetically uh, um, proven. So they don't need to, to break down the DNA. They don't cause mutations. They, they cause cancer through different other, other ways. And, and they, I think with the thread that is common among most of those that have been studied, regardless of the length of the chain, is the toxicity to the immune system. Thank you, Dr. Ruffini. So we have another, we have a question from the audience. Um, so is that the problem with identifying specific chemical substances when other similar compounds can be just as damaging or toxic? When we advocate for limiting or eliminating a class of substances, how can we better educate the community in general and legislators on the need for a class of substance for phase out? I'll take that because we work a lot on classes and have for a long time. And it, it, it's tricky because there are certain uses of these classes. I think it comes back to the essential use concept um, that we have. To, and this is the legislation that Europe is taking the lead, the state of Maine, Canada, um, other states in the US saying that we want to stop the use of all PFAS where the uses aren't essential because there's so many thousands of PFAS where we just can't do them one at a time or even a small group at a time. So it, so PFAS is a really good example of, of where we want to think about the whole class except for essential uses. And uh, it's really encouraging that um, more and more manufacturers and more and more government all around the world are, are starting to go in this direction. So I think that's optimistic news. Um, and as I said, the class concept was even on John Oliver's last week tonight. So then you know. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bloom. And to build on that too, I think one of the concepts that's come out of Europe as well is the idea of compounds that are very persistent and very mobile. Typically when we think about chemicals of high concern, we think about persistence, bioaccumulation, and toxicity, and needing to kind of check all those boxes off before we you know, have a more elevated level of concern about a chemical. But I think PFAS are a perfect example of chemicals that are very persistent and they're mobile in the environment. And even and we have evidence for toxicity for some, but not for you know, many of them have not even been studied for toxicity. But that, that alone, just the fact that they'll stick around for a really long time and get out in the environment means that as we get information about their ability to bioaccumulate and be toxic, they're already out in the environment and we can't rein them back in. So I think that that's a helpful framing as well. Um, and I think it's also, especially with the, the class, it's such a stew of acronyms for consumers trying to wade through this. If you buy, you can look at frying pans and it can say it's PFOA free. So if you have a consumer who's heard about PFAS, they might see that and say, oh great, it doesn't have those PF chemicals. So I think it's, you know, it's just really challenging for consumers to try to wade through all of these acronyms. Um, so that's like many reasons why the, you know, we need to approach these as a class. So along those lines, one of the questions we have received is, how do we know if a product marketed as grease or oil proof or water repellent or nonstick, how do we know if these products have PFAS? Well, you know, nowadays, if they don't, you often find a label that proudly says PFAS, P-F-A-S, free. You know, I had to buy it. I went to the ski area with a jacket that was leaking, and I was so happy to find a jacket that said PFAS free. 
but if it had said PFOA free, I would not have been content. So I think you have to have those four letters and free and uh, I think outdoor gear manufacturers, fry pan manufacturers are starting to get it that they have to say PFAS free. And otherwise, if it doesn't say that, you probably want to avoid things that say stain repellent waterproof because they probably do contain PFAS. And that line's going to move. <laughs> but right now, I, I think you have to assume guilty unless stated innocent. And also, you can call the number in the for the customer service. Mm -hmm and ask them directly. All right, so here's a here's a straightforward question for everyone. Do you think it is possible to get all PFAS out of food packaging? Well, we had food oh. packaging before we had PFAS, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a yes? Ex excellent, oh, excellent response. I, I defer to Maricel on this, but that would be my thought. <laughs> I am I am um, I am optimistic. It will continue to take time, but we just need to keep pushing and pushing. All right, and then we have another question from the audience. Uh, Margot Simon Golden was an advocate for the development of individual self-agency in prevention and advocacy for local communities. In honor of her legacy, how would our scientists advise individuals in reducing their exposure and become local advocates for the reduction of PFAS? If you'd each answer that question. Sure. <laughs> I'll take a first stab at it. Um, you know, I think the first thing is to get educated, to you know, learn about if there's been PFAS found in your drinking water supply. Um, some states like Massachusetts are requiring all public water suppliers to do testing. Um, and EPA did have a, a fairly extensive, although kind of one-time program from 2013 to 2015. So there's there's different levels of information in different states, but that's, that's a big one to learn about first. Um, and then learning about any businesses or industries in your community that might have currently or might have in the past um, used or, or produced PFAS in terms of understanding kind of a community exposure from the environment. Um, learning about any groups in your in your town or in your area that are tackling PFAS related issues, um, either sort of environmental water quality kind of issues or um, from a public health perspective. Um, and I think we have power both as individuals and in terms, uh, Marcel mentioned the procurement policy and um, Michigan, I think that we have power collectively as well. If you're um, mm -hmm. part of a, a company, you know, in terms of having policies at your company about not buying food packaging or furniture that contain PFAS or in your community, you know, the municipal procurement policies are areas where we can sort of elevate and um, amplify our, our concerns. So I, I could go on, but I'm curious what Marcel and Arlene have to say too. Well, I'll add just in your personal shopping to reward companies that do say they're they're PFAS free. And um, I think I'll repeat that we have a web page. If people Google PFAS free, we were asked by communities who've been drinking PFAS contaminated water to please tell us the products, you know, like Keen outdoor shoes are the one kind that don't have PFAS. And so um, I think we want manufacturers to know that if they take the trouble and it's not necessarily that easy for them to water shoes to remove all the PFAS it was a challenge, but the company that did that, uh, more and more people know. So I think when you find these PFAS free products to tell people about them and, and buy them themselves, because ultimately if people stop buying products containing PFAS, the manufacturers are going to stop putting it in. And that is hard for an individual. You know, big procurement is faster and better, but that is something we can all do is, is make those choices and uh, even tell the manufacturers, you know, if you have the bandwidth, if you don't buy a fry pan because it says it's PFOA free, you know, it, it takes some time, but go to the website and write and say, you know, I loved your fry pan and if it were PFAS free, I would have bought it. I, I think just a few of those could, could help mm -hmm. manufacturers make the better choices. Yeah, not to be repetitive, but <laughs> in, in, in a community, you can have some kind of influence over how your, your public funds are used. 
at, at schools, at, at um, you know, uh, at e e even um, the type of um, footwear that is used in schools, if schools still make their own food. Um, also, start uh, being getting more comfortable with talking to your representatives at the state level, at the county level, start small if you want, and then keep going. Uh, they are representing our interests. You have to tell them what your interests are. So get, getting comfortable talking to decision makers. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. I would like to thank our panelists very much for providing such valuable information. MBCC continues to work both locally and nationally to address the damaging health effects of PFAS. We continue to support bills H2348 and S1494 to ban PFAS from food packaging in Massachusetts. We are also currently working to support bills H939 and S207 to remove toxic chemicals, including PFAS, from children's products. We invite you to visit MBCC's website and click on the PFAS tab to learn more and to find ways you can support our efforts. Now, I would like to introduce MBCC's Executive Director, Cheryl Osimo. Thank you, Dr. Oxley. Can you see me? No. Thank you, Dr. Oxley. Yes. Sorry about that. I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Shader, Dr. Muffini, and Dr. Bloom. Thank you so very much. And I'd like to now just say that, you know, Margot, a dear friend, Simon Golden was MBCC's board president for over a decade and was instrumental in shaping the MBCC organization that we know today. She had a vision for the role that the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition could play, not only for the citizens of Massachusetts, but for the greater good. Through her actions and advocacy, she paved the way to change the world for future generations. She is deeply missed by all who knew her and the community at large, but her legacy carries on. I'd like to acknowledge that Margot's loving husband, attorney Neil Golden, along with their daughter-in-law Kate and son Craig are with us here today. And I'm now honored to introduce attorney Andrew Golden, Margot's son, an MBCC board member, who will present the inaugural Margot Simon Golden Distinguished Service Award to Dr. Gwen Coleman, the acting deputy director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Welcome to you, Andrew. Welcome, Craig. Welcome, Neil. And welcome, Kate. I'll turn it over to you, Andrew. And there are the children. Their names, please. Yeah. Uh, Ellison Saul. Thank you. Uh, so, so thank you, Cheryl. Um, and as Cheryl mentioned, Margot was my stepmother, but for more than 25 years, in all the ways that count the most, she was in fact my mom, the most selfless, compassionate, and soft-hearted person you could ever hope to meet. Those who knew Margot through her tireless work with MBCC are undoubtedly aware of these traits. No one who met her walked away without feeling them. We lost Margot almost exactly one year ago. While my father, Neil, my brother, Craig, my wife, Kate, Margot's grandsons, Ellis and Saul, Margot's brothers, her sister-in-law, her nieces, cousins, and friends are all deeply touched at the organization Mar Margot worked for and led as president for so many years. We choose to honor her with this important award. In addition to a dedicated fund in her memory to which you may donate at mbcc.org if you're moved to do so. I think it is, uh, important that I speak for anyone listening today who has lost someone in what should have been the prime of their life to breast cancer when I say we'd far rather have Margot with us than any accolade to honor her. The name of this award is very well suited to the person who inspired it, the Margot Simon Golden Distinguished Service Award. It's heavy to think about, but uh, and I do think about it often, but Margot was first diagnosed with breast cancer when she was several years younger than I am now and died from it at an age most people would be contemplating the best and most active years of a happy retirement. 
I think I can say that she did not turn inward in bitterness, although no one would have blamed her for doing so. She certainly sought all the best treatment available and she received it. But the mission of the MBCC and what it is most focused on is not treatment. There are other organizations that focus on that. It is prevention with a keen and unyielding focus on our environment and what we have the agency to demand and to change. It is seeking a future where other people do not have to endure what Margot endured. That is what was most important to Margot. That, in a word, is service. Dr. Gwen Coleman is the first annual recipient of this Margot Simon Golden Distinguished Service Award. Having familiarized myself with Dr. Coleman's work during the selection process, I cannot think of a more fitting recipient. Dr. Coleman's work was Margot's mission. May it continue on until someday, with the effort of all now listening, it may not be needed. Thank you. Now, Dr. Coleman, on behalf of the MBCC and the Golden family, I would like to present you with the first annual Margot Simon Golden Distinguished Service Award. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your kind words and uh, helping me to remember your mother. Uh, uh, your words were really touching and beautiful. I'd also like to thank uh, both your, you, your wife, Kate, your father, Neil, your brother, Craig, the entire Golden family, the board of directors of the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, including the D executive director, Cheryl Osimo, for this honor in the name of your mother, Margot Simon Golden. I was reminded recently that I had the opportunity to meet Margot and Cheryl together at the Silent Spring Institute's anniversary gala a few years ago. Cheryl and Margot were full of excitement about the longstanding partnership between MBCC and the Silent Spring Institute. It was such a delight to chat with them. I also want to thank Julie Brody for introducing me to MBCC way back in the 1990s when we were all beginning on our journey to discover how environmental exposures might impact a woman's risk for breast cancer. I really wish we were all together today in the same room so I could greet and shake hands with each and every member of the Golden family and thank you personally for this award. When I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, I was introduced to some interesting case studies in occupational and environmental health. As a young epidemiology student, I was Mass, I was uh, intrigued at what seemed like a very simple, straightforward relationship between chemical exposure X and disease Y, and those chemicals were either in the workplace or found in our environment. I believed, I guess it was naive at the time, that you could identify the cause, you could remove it, and people would escape disease. It was then that I thought I could pursue a career in environmental epidemiology and environmental health. So during my PhD years at UNC, University of North Carolina, I learned that it was way more complicated than what I first had thought, but I was really ready to learn many ways to be able to uh, precisely characterize a person's exposure to chemicals, uh, those many common chemicals that we've been talking about today and others, and work on diseases of great public health importance and understand the risks in many diverse populations. So I charted a career at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and there I have had the great fortune to have a career that allows me to develop and implement important research pro programs to probe what seems like the endless complexities of these exposure disease relationships with the best and brightest scientists across the US and abroad. In the mid 1990s, I was able to see and hear the power of the breast cancer advocacy community make a mighty call to action to government agencies and academic scientists to pay attention to the emerging data that suggested a role for environmental chemicals in breast cancer risk. My agency, NIEHS, allowed me to lead the way to create a robust research program that lasted about 15 years in the area of breast cancer and environment. And they, it, we included environmental scientists, population scientists, cancer biologists, and breast cancer advocates working together in partnership to create knowledge that was missing from the breast cancer story at that time. 
It wouldn't be a simple task to identify the single environmental cause and just remove it and therefore prevent breast cancer, but rather a long, hard journey that we took together to create the evidence for multiple chemicals, for the other intervening factors, and try to understand the causal web of breast cancer risk and work together to apply what we learned. One of the most rewarding aspects for me over these years has been to get to know and listen to the stories from the advocates about their views on what caused their breast cancers, about their fears regarding these chemical exposures, and also to listen to them talk about how dedicated they were in their energies to this cause because they didn't want other women to have to go through what they went through. They didn't want their daughters or their granddaughter, granddaughters to face the same risks. And this was really a theme that uh, resonated with me over and over during these years. Research with translational partners such as the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition is so important. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure I really have to tell the people listening to this webinar why, but let me give you my view on this. I think it's important because we wanna make sure the work is relevant and real, and that the results of the studies make their way into the hands of those who deserve to know and can do something about it. Our advocacy partners help by working on research teams, learning about the scientific methods and uh, teaching us about translation. They interpret science speak to their peers and to the policymakers who need to know and have the ability to act on this evidence. This is all part of the MBCC mission and we've heard about this multiple times already today. The message to me was always loud and clear. Prevention is critically important. Help us reduce our risks of exposure. What can we do about it? And please keep us safe. MBCC has been a valued partner in several of our NIEHS research programs as part of the Breast Cancer and Environment Research Program, working with Karen Michaels at UCLA and the team at Silent Spring, as part of our Superfund Research Program at the University of Rhode Island, the Steep Center that was mentioned before, and with Silent Spring Institute on many other important research projects. So after many years in this role as program developer, facilitator of science and translation of findings and impacts, I've made a lot of friends and acquaintances along the way. And I've greatly benefited from building relationships with people like Cheryl Osimo and the other members of the MBCC that I was able to meet over the years. The advocates across the country, like Karen Miller at the Huntington Breast Cancer uh, Action Coalition and Jeannie Rizzo at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. They all lead special advocacy groups that are focusing on the role of environmental chemicals and breast cancer prevention. These relationships have full, fueled my passion and intensity that I put into my work every day. Being recognized by MBCC for something that has become part of my core is very humbling. So I've been told that Margo and I share some traits. We're both passionate about the role of environment. We're passionate about reducing risk and focusing on prevention of disease. And we are both fighters. It's such an honor and privilege to stand before you today, even though virtually I'm really sitting before you today, um, to become the first recipient of the Margo Simon Golden Distinguished Service Award. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. It is something I and my family will never forget. Thank you so much. And also thanks for this beautiful award. This crystal globe is really stunning and it's quite heavy. So I'm gonna put it down now. You deserve it, Dr. Gwen Coleman. Thank you for your beautiful words, your kind words and remembering Margot Simon Golden. On behalf of the Golden family, the entire Golden family, and there are many that aren't on the screen, Dr. Barbara Malkus, the entire MBCC Board of Directors, our staff and consultants, we would like to first thank 
the panelists, our panelists, Dr. Arlen Bloom, Dr. Laurel Shader, who I work with almost every day at Silent Spring Institute, Dr. Mary Sell Maffini, and of course, Dr. Oxley, who's on our board of directors, and all attendees for participating in the inaugural Margot Simon Golden Tribute webinar. I know that Margot would be very proud of her entire family. And the fact that Andrew was able to present the award to Dr. Gwen Coleman. I said I wouldn't do this, but I am getting a little teary-eyed. How can you not? Congratulations, Dr. Coleman. Margo and Gwen have never wavered in their dedication towards breast cancer prevention. And I love what you said, Gwen, and it was so true. You're both fighters. That's what we do to get the job done. And as we talked about earlier in the week, People may not always love us. People may not always like us. But we have to do what we have to do to get the job done. And thank you for making it possible for us to do that, along with our sister organization, Silent Spring Institute, and so many others in Massachusetts and beyond who work hard every day on these issues. We're a team. We're a coalition. We're a family. And Neil, please know that we're with you every day in the work that we do. Margo, is right here next to me, her photo. And of course, always, Rachel Carson was right. She sent this to me. I have, about a, thousand, I have about a thousand of those in the house. Uh, uh, Margo, NBC meant so much to her. Um, and, and, she lo and she loved every minute of it. And, and on behalf of the Golden and Simon families, because the Simon family is an equal part of this. Uh, thank you. Thank you for letting us drive you a little crazy sometimes, Neil. I know it wasn't always easy with the long phone calls and, and meetings, but uh, she moved mountains. Yeah. As Dr. Gwen Coleman has done, as Dr. Julie Brody has done, as Dr. Laurel Shader and the other speakers here today. Thank you all so much for not wavering in your dedication toward breast cancer prevention. And Margo, we love you and miss you. Thank you everyone for joining us today.